Okay, so what are we talking about? I'm gonna jump right into it here. Uh, dualism and calculation. This is a kind of thing, uh, I've read human action cover to cover at least seven times, I think, and every time I come back to it, I'm just more blown away by you know how smart Mises is. It's kind of like the, I'm gonna maybe not get it exactly right, but Mark Twain has a quote where he says something like, when I was 14 years old, I couldn't stand my father. He was, you know, I could, the, the old man knew nothing. I didn't want to be near him. And then by the time I was 21, I realized in the seven years, I was shocked by how much he had learned. Okay, and so <laughs> it's the same kind of thing here. Like since Mises was in the ground, there's no way he kept learning more economics as I got older. And so it was clearly the fact that you know, I learned more stuff, but it's not just economics that, uh, you know, Mises, he was very conversant with like quantum physics, and he's got little footnotes talking about how quantum uncertainty does not change the results of our discussion above. I mean, it's astonishing what a Renaissance man he was and how well read he was. Um, and just you notice that just if you go through and read it. So let me just say at the outset here, I know, uh, you know, our movement just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And some of the earlier talks allude to that fact that I can even say uh, for myself. So I went to grad school uh, from what, 98 to 03. And uh, in the beginning, it, it really was the case that a lot of people didn't know what the Austrian school was. Like I went to this thing called the Austrian Colloquium. I went to NYU, uh, you know, Joe Salerno was there and Israel Kurzer, Mario Rizzo, guys like that. And my classmates, you know, who were going through the NYU program with me, they were like, what, what is it that you do every Monday? And, and go, and it, but then of course, when, you know, big deal was when Ron Paul ran for president. So that's what put us to the stage of where people would just make fun of us. But or before that, like, no one even knew what it was. And so I have seen that. And because of that, I should say, you know, because the, the rise of social media and podcasts and whatever, our message is getting out there. But I've noticed online sometimes, you know, self-described Austrian fans will get into arguments with people and it's clear they don't have a great grounding in economics. Like their conclusions are right. They don't trust the state. They know, you know, private property is great. But in terms of just battling some interventionist on some matter of economic theory, that some of them, you know, they need more grounding. So I would say if you really, you know, want to call yourself an Austrian at some point, you got to buckle down and read Human Action. And I think you're going to find it. It's, it's amazing. It, it literally changed my life. Okay. It's, it's um, not just about economics. It's like a whole worldview. Like he just has asides about how the Roman Empire fell and how come the barbarian hordes, you know, before Rome repelled them, but then what happened? He's, oh, because of the price controls. I mean, it's just amazing how it's just a cohesive worldview that you're going to get and just reading secondhand accounts or you know, other people trying to distill it out is not gonna give you the full flavor. So I encourage you, definitely uh, read it when you can. Okay, so let me, so for today's talk, you know, and what I do in the paper, I'm obviously just gotta boil it down here, some of the essentials for you guys. Let me just uh, focus on two areas where superficially, yes, anybody who's conversant with the Austrian school is gonna know these topics. I'm gonna be talking about um, dualism and calculation. But again, with, with successive readings, the more I went back and the more I learned about other fields and that I became more knowledgeable just about the world of ideas, just the more astonished I am when I go back and reread what Mises you know, had published in 1949. It's incredible that he's still, to give you an example, the stuff I'm gonna talk about here, if you read about people arguing about AI and whether like, is it really alive? Does it think, is it conscious? I'm not exaggerating for dramatic effect here. Like Mises is much better commentary on those sorts of philosophical issues than 99% of what you're going to see nowadays when people argue about that. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's astonishing if you go back and look at this. So let me just try to make sure you're catching like why it, it's, it's very breezy, but there's, so, there's such depth here. Okay, so start with what's the name of the book, Human Action? And I don't know, for me, I got this in high school, senior year in high school. And I didn't, why is he calling it human action? Like I thought it was gonna be like economics or you know, how the economy works or something like that, but human action, I didn't understand. And also I was like the guy, um, I guess what Hans was saying that Salerno was like, that in the beginning I used to tell people, yeah, you can skip the beginning stuff, the philosophy, get, you know, get to the good stuff, get to the economics, how's the business cycle happen? And now I understand much better why Mises felt the need to you know, when I, in, in fairness to me, like as a senior in high school, you don't see many people going around beating the drum for logical positivism. And so <laughs> when Mises has taken such pains to make sure you understand how wrong these people are, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I won't be a logical positivist. Thanks, Mises. But and now I get what you, the importance, and it's not merely because of that historical controversy, but, you know, to, to get the rigorous footing of like, what are we doing in economics? What, what is it? And just placing it in the history of ideas. 
Okay, so human action is purposeful behavior, or we may say action is will put into operation and transformed into an agency. Okay, so just right there, again, that's very deep. He's, he's merging two separate things right there, right? There, it's a, a fundamental difference between the social sciences and the natural sciences, that, that move, right? The, the attitude of the observer to say, we are going to interpret this situation not merely as the result of blind mechanical processes, but we're gonna posit the existence of some external mind or, or some will, some ego. Okay, that's a fundamental move. And we do it so much in our day-to-day -day lives that you, know, you take it for granted, and that's why it might not seem like a big deal. But that's what, what he's doing here, right? And, and, it, and that partly explains why the uh, you know, more mainstream economists who are in love with the physicist and they want to you know, ape everything. And it's funny, they're not copying current physics. They're always copying like physics from 50 years earlier. But they think to be scientific, you have to be like a physicist. But a physicist is not wondering, you know, why did the electron choose to do that, right? <laughs> That's not what's going on there. Okay? And so I'm saying here, we do have some insight into what is it to prefer and to choose and, and so forth. So that kind of explains why Mises thinks for economics or you know, praxeology more generally, this attitude is appropriate and it's entirely scientific to, to proceed in this fashion. All right, I won't dwell here. Let me just, I'll give you some more quotes and then I'll, I'll dwell more on like why this is such an important fundamental move here. Okay, uh, reason and experience show us two separate realms, the external world of physical, chemical, and physiological phenomena and the internal world of thought, feeling, valuation, and purposeful action. No bridge connects, as far as we can see today, these two spheres. Identical external events result sometimes in different human responses, and different external events produce sometimes the same human response. We do not know why. All right, and so he, you know, he's, this is coming out originally in 1949, and that, I think, sums it up still to this day, right? There's been lots of progress in terms of, you know, experiments, like you cut open someone's brain. And, I mean, don't do this at home. But you, you cut, up, cut open someone's brain, you're, you're poking stuff, and, you know, like, they might remember something. Or there's really cool ones where, like, you give somebody a choice, you know, to choose the red ball or the blue ball, and then they go to pick, and, like, the, the scientist can tell from the electrical signal which one they're gonna pick before they, they themselves choose it, right? So there's lots of cool little things like that, but ultimately there is some sense in which it sure seems like our minds control, or not control, influence the external world. And, and again, this is so obvious to us that we kind of just breeze past it, but if I were to tell you without context, like if you didn't have me you know, sit up here and you already knew kind of the context, but if I just said, I can control matter with my mind, you would be like, Oh, shut up, get, you know, get out of here. And I'm like, no, watch, watch, ready? <laughs> this is matter, right? This is made up of molecules and atoms, right? Protons, neutrons. You're tell I'm telling you, I'm doing this. Like, go ahead, give me the pattern you want, and I promise you it will follow the pattern you specify. There's no way that's random. I am controlling matter with my mind, right? <laughs> and, and so, again, we, we just take it for granted. And then also, too, it's you know, a hypothesis because it's, it sure seems to me the, like I'm thinking and I have desires and preferences and what, and then I, you know, I have some partial control over what unfolds in the external world. And I see, you know, you bags of cells walking around too. And I hypothesize that maybe you got something going on in there too. Some of you, not so much, but, <laughs> but, but you get what I'm saying? But strictly speaking, I don't know, right? And there's sol solipsism and there's some, you know, all kinds of philosophical things going down that path, like, how do I know? Maybe I'm the only person. Maybe this is all a simulation made for, you know, maybe it's the Truman Show or something. But it wouldn't be the Truman Show, right? Because then no one would be watching if, if I were the only person, okay? So you get the point. And I'm saying, even though the, some of this seems like it's stuff you might talk about at the frat party or whatever, but this is very relevant to the social sciences. I mean, just something as simple as, um, like this thing right here. W what is this? Is this a weapon? And you might say, well, no, it's, it's designed to help you see. But if you've seen The Godfather, I think it's part three, this can be a weapon. If you want to come up here, I'll show you. No, okay. Don't go watch The Godfather part three. I don't even want to talk about that, but uh, it shouldn't be in the same category. Okay, so you, you get the point that, and, and just notice there, why, what does it mean to say this? It's not a fact. I think actually Hayek has a cool essay called The Facts of the Social Sciences, and he gets, he talks about this stuff, like what makes something a tool or a weapon? It's not just a, 
a description of its physical properties and like its capabilities in terms of matter. It's, it has to do with the intentions that people assign to it. And that's what makes it a tool or a weapon. Okay, so again, it, it seems like, oh, okay, yeah, but it, it really does matter. And if you say why, I mean, you read human action, he spells out, you know, why that is the case. Okay, so again, here, I think Mises summed up, and that's, this is still the case, right? So he's not definitively laying down and just saying for the rest of time, we're not going to make any progress. I mean, he, I don't think I have in these quotes here, but he does say, you know, it, down the road, if scientists do make more inroads and they, they really come up with a good theory in terms of predicting and reducing what seems to be free will and human choices down to more primitive mechanistic causes, and, the, and that's a very reliable thing, then may, you know, maybe that would supplant what we're doing right now with praxeology. But until then, it's very productive and useful to us as scientists to, you know, hypothesize the existence of external minds at work. And that's, that's a good way to proceed. You're going you're gonna to succeed in life better with that hypothesis than if you just try to treat everyone as, you know, molecules bouncing around. Okay, so maybe, that, maybe that's a way of putting it. That, yeah, you could uh, concede that, yes, probably if we could completely specify the state of the universe at time T0, there's a sense in which the state at T1 is pretty much determined or at least within, you know, the bounds of uncertainty from quantum mechanics. But still, that, that's impractical to you as an acting person. That's not going to get you anywhere. You have to take a shortcut and say, well, I think people have motivations and that guy coming at me with a knife, I'm not going to try to calculate his momentum and instead I'm going to get out of the way because he's trying to attack me, right? So that's, that's the idea. Okay. But as long as we do not know how external facts, physical and physiological, produce in a human mind definite thoughts and volitions resulting in concrete acts, we have to face an insurmountable methodological dualism. Okay, so again, that word methodological, and that's why I had it italicized up there. I can't tell if it's coming across to you in the font. But so he's not, he's not adopting like a philosophical or a metaphysical dualism. He's not even committing himself to that. I mean, he might have his own views on it one way or the other, but his point is, as social scientists right now, we have to use this, just methodologically speaking, because it's, this is the most fruitful avenue of proceeding. If we want to explain market phenomena, right now we have no choice but to assume there are acting minds out there, but, it's, but they're not just free-floating entities. Like they, they work through or they, they influence, is probably the best verb to use there, the, the, what we might call the real physical world. Okay, so if you like this kind of stuff, I, I don't think I would have fully appreciated what Mises was doing had I not read uh, Hoppe's book here. I, I think I saw this. I think it's still there. And certainly you can go and get the online PDF. By the way, let me just mention, we, we sort of take that for granted too, all of these works that are available for free at the, you know, the Mises Institute website. I think Tho earlier mentioned that in the last five years, human action has gotten something like 2 million downloads. I'm personally responsible for about 180,000 of those, just you know, so they put a little asterisk. But you know, the, you want to go look something up, and you just go right to the website, and boom, it's right, it's right there. So it's very useful to scholars. And I think that, I'm, I'm being serious, I think that partly explains the popularity and resurgence of this, is that all that stuff is there. Whereas if you like some other people's work or schools of thought, you have to go get you know, some library, some book from the library, because you wanted to go buy it, it would be like $200 or something. Like it's crazy, the academic book market. And so the fact that these things are all available in PDF is pretty amazing. But what, among other things that Hoppe does here, and, and one of them, I don't have time to dwell on it now, is he explains, when Mises talks about um, like the a priori method, like what is it, how do we proceed in economics? It's not like what we do in physics or chemistry, right? That it's, you start out with axioms and then logically deduce certain propositions that are necessarily true, so long as the original axioms were true and you didn't make a mistake in your deductive reasoning. And I think some people thought Mises was wagging his finger at everybody and saying, hey, you guys are all doing economics wrong, do it this way, because I think it's better. And that's not originally what he was doing. Mises was just distilling down the method of good economists, like that had come before him and that he was you know, carrying the torch with. And, and Hoppe has some great quotes in here that I haven't seen elsewhere from earlier uh, you know, classical economists and, and others where, you know, sh showing their thoughts on methodology and, and that it's, it's also the same thing. So it's not that this is some crankish Austrian perspective. 
This is how good economists describe what it was they were doing. So that's in here. But beyond that, as far as the particular issue at hand, um, he says, all right, so there's some, there's some jargon in here, but our mental categories have to be understood as ultimately grounded in categories of action. And as soon as this is recognized, all idealistic suggestions immediately disappear. Instead, an epistemology claiming the existence of true synthetic a priori propositions becomes a realistic epistemology. Since it is understood as ultimately grounded in categories of action, the gulf between the mental and the real outside physical world is bridged. As categories of action, they must be mental things as much as they are characteristics of reality. And then here it is. For it is through actions that the mind and reality make contact. Okay, so maybe I'm overselling it by saying Mises solved the mind-body problem, but he certainly uh, circumscribed it, right? Like I'm saying that's what it is. If you're familiar from other areas of people talking about the mind-body problems, that's what the action axiom is. It's linking your immaterial, intangible, mental states, if you will, with the physical movements of your body. Right? Like, what does it mean? You know, you see someone, there, there's a glass of water and someone, actually, look at this, look at these props. You go like that and then someone goes like that and you could say, why is he doing that? And you say, oh, because he's thirsty. Okay, so I'm, this, as trivial as that is, there's a lot packed into there. You have to assume that, that you know, there's, a, there's something that has desires, right, to just talk like that. Like if you saw, if you saw a waterfall, and it was doing, you wouldn't say, oh, the, the ground is thirsty, right? No, you'd be using like F equals MA and, you know, gravitational constant. Like that's the way you would describe that. But to see me doing that with the water bottle, you say, oh, because he's thirsty. There's a lot packed into there that, that you assume there's some kind of being that has desires. And you're also assuming that I know water quenches that, right? Like if you saw me going like that, ah, and then you said, what are you doing? He said, because he's thirsty. That, that would be stupid, right? Because that, that, this doesn't satisfy, it doesn't quench thirst, right? So there's a lot packed in. And you assume that I have control of my arm, okay? So it, again, we take a lot for granted, but the point being that um, just the action axiom packs a lot of stuff in there philosophically, what people have in mind when they talk about the mind-body problem. Just to show you why this is still relevant, I was listening to a podcast recently, um, and the person, it was, it was a, like a computer scientist guy, and he was explaining why he thought the standard Darwinian account doesn't adequately explain the uh, consciousness. Okay, so whether, you don't need to agree with the guy's point here, but I just want to show you the, the relation to this. And so the idea was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the idea was, if you're a materialist, so, so really what the guy was trying to do was to show you can't just be a materialist. Like that doesn't, that's incoherent. You can't explain human consciousness if you're, if you're a strict materialist. And his point was, if you're a materialist, first and foremost, and you think that's like the reality and anything else is just kind of epiphenomena is the word they use, then that means you think, okay, I could tell a story just looking like at the atomic and molecular scale of, you know, there's the Big Bang, and then this happened, and the Earth formed, and, da, 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 and then there's a pond, and lightning hits, and then the, the first cell, and then there's DNA, and da, 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 there's all this, there's random mutations, and, and so forth. And I could tell the whole story going from, you know, non-life up to all the species and stuff we see around us and human beings walking around and whatever. And I would never have to talk about consciousness or the ego, right? I would just be talking in physical terms about atoms bouncing around. And so then, you know, and they would have to, you could tell the story that way, right? If you were just a strict materialist. And then his point was, so what role is consciousness playing in there? Like there'd be no reason, no evolutionary advantage if you could tell the story without it. And so anyway, so he was just going through and that's why he thought that was a self-defeating uh, Pass to go down. But whether you agree with that or not, I'm just saying these insights are still relevant in all these debates about AI and, and so forth today. Okay. Let me now jump in. I don't have much time left before I turn it over to Jeff here. Another area where, again, we talk about the socialist calculation problem, the things that, you know, how is it that profit and loss accounting work in a market economy? But it's, it's a lot deeper and richer then you may, may realize. Let me just try to, in these last few minutes, illuminate some of that. Okay, so Mises starts out, and he says, the gradation of the means is like that of the ends, a process of preferring A to B. It is preferring and setting aside. It is manifestation of a judgment that A is more intensely desired than is B. It opens a field for application of ordinal numbers, but it is not open to application of cardinal numbers and arithmetical operations based on them. Okay, so we throw those terms around. Let me just make sure you're not getting lost. 
ordinal is a ranking, like first, second, third, 75th. Those are ordinal numbers, whereas cardinal, are, you know, one, two, three, but also 7.942, 15, 17 right? Like those are cardinal. So it makes sense to say what's two plus five. It doesn't make sense to say what's second plus seventh, right? It's not that if you took the second most highly ranked thing and the seventh most and added them somehow or combined them, they turned into the ninth most highly ranked, right? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Whereas to take the number two and the number seven, add them, it turns into the number nine, okay? So that's what he's getting at. He's saying just pure choice itself, human action as such, leads to an ordinal ranking of things, at least in principle, right? Like when a person chooses one thing over another, you know he preferred the first thing to the second thing. That's what you can conclude that. But you can't say he prefers the first thing 37% more than the second thing, right? There's, you can't bring in arithmetic. Okay, and then he, going along with that, he says um, part of the mistake that going back to Aristotle and up even through the classical economists, like even the, the great ones, uh, people it was assumed first established the magnitude of value proper to goods and services by an act of measurement and then proceeded to barter them against quantities of goods and services of the same amount of value. Right? So he's saying that's what people had in mind, and he's saying that's wrong. Right? There, there was this assumption, I guess, again, going back to Aristotle, like if, if two items exchange in the marketplace, like 10 potatoes for 13 apples, that, oh, the amount of total value in the two of those must be equal, and that's why they traded. And then, you know, and proceeding from there, at least if the, if the, if the trade was a fair one, or, you know, they might have caveats, but that, that was the idea. They, th and they thought that people must have some kind of yardstick of measurement of value, and that's what we're trying to, as, as economic theorists, isolate. And you even see this to this day, even with fans of the free market, right? So, um, I think George Gilder had a book that came out, and then Steve Forbes had a book where, and you understand where they're coming from, where they're, they're complaining about government fiat money inflation and how it's debasing the dollar, and they'll use phrases like, you know, money is supposed to be a measuring rod, but, you know, you would, it wouldn't be a very good meter stick if the government could just make it get longer or shorter, right? So you get where they're coming from that if you're trying to do your accounting and every year the dollar gets weaker, well, that screws everything up. And, and that's true insofar as it goes, but then... They're kind of making the, the opposite mistake of thinking to be good, money has to be this fixed measuring rod, just like, you know, a foot is 12 inches, period. And, and that's, you know, I can't get into it now, but, but that's, that's wrong. You don't, if you think of it like that, you're, you're missing the, the point. Okay, and, that, and that's what Mises is getting at here. Okay, so how's this? Our civilization is inseparably linked with our methods of economic calculation. It would perish if we were to abandon this most precious intellectual tool of acting. Goethe was right in calling bookkeeping by double entry one of the finest inventions of the human mind. Okay, most people, if you grabbed them and said, what's some of the finest inventions of humanity? They might say fire, they might say, you know, the show Seinfeld, they might say other things. <laughs> Probably they're not gonna say double entry bookkeeping, right? But this is to show just how critical Mises thought. In fact, I think I even got, I think I have it in here, yeah. It was cognition of what is going on within a world in which action is com computable and calculable that led men to elaboration of the sciences of praxeology and economics. Economics is essentially a theory of that scope of action in which calculation is applied or can be applied if certain conditions are realized. And here you go. No other distinction is of greater significance, both for life and the study of human action, than that between calculable action and non-calculable action. Modern civilization is above all characterized by the fact that it has elaborated a method which makes the use of arithmetic possible in a broad field of activities. Okay, so this is something that I didn't catch until I was working on my book, Choice, if you're familiar with that, and that jumped out at me. Like I knew, you know, oh yeah, calculation, how to allocate resources, but here he's saying civilization itself, like our ability to use arithmetic in all sorts of areas critically depends on what you know, we call economic calculation. All right, the use of money prices, okay? So I'm assuming you guys know where it comes from. I don't have time to get into it, but that's the idea, right? So it's not just that, oh yeah, if you wanna have high economic growth or something or not squander your oil resources, you wanna have a profit and loss account and you wanna have market price. No, he's saying civilization itself depends on this, that us to be able to use arithmetic ultimately is, you know, besides just in terms of pure math, but to make it relevant to our daily lives, it's ultimately working through uh, economic calculation in some respect, which again depends on 
private property and the use of money to get, he says elsewhere, like a common denominator. Okay, so this comes in, uh, Salerno, in one of his papers, is, is talking about this, and, it, and he had, again, a phrase that jumped out at me because it, it crystallized what I was kind of thinking myself, that he's saying, um, I conceive appraisement, so appraisement meaning, like just the name suggests, like an appraiser, right? Like if you get storm damage and someone from the insurance company comes and appraises it, right? They're looking to see what's the damage, right? So they're assessing monetary values if they're looking at something. So in general, in this context, he's saying like the entrepreneur appraising, you know, what, 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 do, what are the assets of the business right now? Let me appraise them. And so if I put them on the balance sheet, I'd put sensible numbers. It's neither knowledge nor arithmetic, but it's something new under the sun introduced into the world only when the institutional prerequisites of a market economy are fulfilled. Okay. And part of the way to see that in this last slide I got here, it ties into um, th there's an important distinction between what we sometimes call the calculation problem versus the Hayek that Mises you know, came up with in his salvo against socialism versus what is often referred to as the Hayekian knowledge problem. So they're both important things, and I want to be clear, like what's so-called Hayek's knowledge papers, those are excellent, especially if you're going into like a PhD in economics. Go read those things. They're, they're great. But there sometimes is a conflation in the Austrian camp of saying like, oh yeah, Hayek just kind of elaborate. And no, they're, they're fundamentally different things that in particular, Mises conceded for the sake of argument, not only that the planners you know, were nice guys, that they weren't murderous dictators, but also that they had available all the different technical knowledge. And then he was saying still, and he also conceded that they understood like the consumer goods and like it'd be better to have 200 more diapers versus you know, 30 more apples, you know, those sorts of consumer first order good uh, rankings. And he said still, even ex post, the planners can't say whether they used, made an efficient use of society's scarce resources. And that's a totally different thing from what Hayek was saying about a lot of the knowledge is tacit and it's dispersed around and you know, the, the planner isn't able to mobilize it. Again, it's, it's all important stuff. And, and you know, if someone's trying to take over the country to become a socialist planner, you wanna make sure, use whatever argument you got to, to stop them. But the point being, those are clearly distinct things. And in fact, if you go read the original debates, uh, Langa, one of the, you know, the mar so-called market socialists, he seized on that, that he said, uh, I think it was in 36, his paper, and he said something like, ah, we see now that Professor Hayek and Robbins, referring to Lionel Robbins, have, have retreated from Professor Mises' original position. And now there's, they're agreeing that in principle, you know, the, economic, the, the equations of mainstream economics can, can solve the planning problem. And now they're just resorting to, you know, all oh, practical difficulties and there'd be too many equations to solve in real time. And so Lange was real smug, but I don't think he was, that was a cheap shot. I think if you go and you know, read the debates, yes, that Hayek actually in a sense did retreat from the position. Now, if somebody wants to argue, maybe, he, and I have, and, and Joe may remember, you know, at the NYU colloquium, some people were arguing that the saying, yeah, Mises' position was too strong because for you guys who've taken, like you got the social indifference curves and you got the production possibilities frontier and just where's the tangency and that's where the planner should go. And there's a sense in which that's what Mises conceded, so he's wrong. So good thing Hayek, you know, retreated to a more defensible. If someone wants to argue, that's a fun argument to have. But for someone to say they're saying the same thing to me, that, that's clearly, you know, misreading the, the, what they wrote. And that's what Lange was putting his finger on. So again, all this stuff with calculation, I, I think, you know, understand it wasn't just a matter of, oh, yeah, if you want your economy to grow a few percentage points more per year, you need market prices. Like, no, Mises said civilization itself rests on that. It's linking again. So the first thing, linking the immaterial mind to physical reality, that's the action axiom. And the calculation is individual preferences of, of choosing. And how does that turn into market allocation and like economical use of resources? Okay, thanks everybody. Thank